Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And we're back here with the weekly news. Of course, the weekly news is brought to us by Nick Bendel. Welcome, Nick. Thank you for having me, Owen. I, I love seeing you and chatting with you every week. Yes, it's um, it's the, the highlight of the week so far, every week. Well, yes, it is always the highlight of the week so far, given that we meet first thing Monday morning. Yes, yes. But besides that, it is the week, yeah, highlight of the week so far. So, you know, it's, um, you don't have to qualify it, Nick, jeez. No, no, I suppose I don't. Uh, but would you say meeting with me is the highlight of any week at any time? Oh, maybe not every week, but yeah, maybe some weeks, yeah. Okay, maybe some weeks. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know when, when, when I can um, put that notch on the wall. Well, I can honestly say that the for the property investor podcasts we do together are the best for the property investor podcast I do with anyone. Yes, thank you, Nick. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's been happening in your week this past week? Well, it's something uh, exciting happened for one of our clients. I am the owner of Hunter and Scribe, which is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. We work with dozens of mortgage brokers throughout Australia. And we recently wrote two award submissions for a particular mortgage broker and just found out that he was nominated as a finalist in both categories for the Australian Broking Awards. Very excited for him. Fantastic. Uh, it's um, well done to, to you, Nick. I mean, you wrote it. So, um, you know, uh, I'll give you the award in, in, <laughs> from that respect. I'm wondering if uh, award organizations don't have awards for writing awards. <laughs> yes. You, you never know. Maybe one day. Yeah, something for them to think about. Anyway, that was my week. How was your week? Oh, very busy week last week. And um, on Thursday, highlight of the week. Sorry, it wasn't the podcasts last week. Yeah. Um, but the highlight of the week was... Um, um, the PM Summit, which I attended on Thursday, which was a, um, a one-day conference for property ma for the property management industry. And it was great. All the movers and shakers in the industry from all over the country came to uh, Sydney and, uh, well, specifically Manly and on the Northern Beaches. And, uh, yes, it was lots of great education and uh, lots of information about what's changing and happening in the in the property management industry and and a lot of education from from uh, leaders in the industry of how we can better serve our clients uh, as as well as better serving um, tenants as well so uh, to try and improve the experience for all can i ask owen what was one big thing you learned from the conference or one big thing you're planning to implement to your business leafield uh, one big thing is, is um, uh, and it's something that uh, I had thought of anyway to do, but there was one speaker that uh, uh, spoke about her business and how they implemented a, a video training session. Uh, not so much training, but information, um, uh, in, information videos where uh, you can send them to, to clients, you know, property owners, landlords, um, to be able to help them understand the processes that happen within property management. So what's the leasing process um, and you know, what's involved in the leasing process and, and timings and things like that. So it, it's all those little things that can um, help owners understand easily and um, can be little you know, uh, three-minute videos just to go through uh, all of these different processes so that um, they understand what we're doing in the background um, so that they don't think that uh, nothing's happening. I like it. That is a very smart idea. And I know a lot of people really engage with the video. Yes. And, and in fact, it's not something that um, should be just 
uh, done for the property management uh, industry. Anyone that has clients where there's a a, a long or ongoing process um, uh, for for clients to understand what happens in the background is quite important. Otherwise, they they think that just nothing's happening. Oh, quite okay. often. Well, well, I'm glad to hear it was such a great conference. Thank you for sharing. Should we get on to the three news stories of the week? Oh, yes, the, the news. That's what we're here for, isn't it? It is indeed. Uh, our, our first story today, Owen, Tasmania making renting more pet friendly. Tasmania's parliament is debating a bill that would allow tenants to keep pets. If the bill passes, tenants would be able to keep pets without the landlord's consent, provided they notified the landlord. Only the Tasmanian Civil and Administrative Appeals Tribunal would be able to rule that a pet could not be kept on the premises. The landlord would have 28 days to apply to the tribunal if they objected to the pet being on the premises. Alternatively, they could consent without conditions or they could agree with the tenant on conditions of consent. Also, the bill states that landlords could not reject applications from tenants because the tenant intended to have a pet. Owen, always keen to get your thoughts. Does this proposal from the Tasmanian government sound fair or is it overreach? Um, if, if based, based on the information here, it uh, seems like it's going a little bit too far. I, you know, in general, I, I don't have an issue with uh, all tenants having the right to have a pet, um, but it, it needs they, they they can't have a horse in a one bedroom unit. Um, yeah, technically that can be a pet. Um, so there needs to be some some more specific guidelines other than y yes, Mr. Landlord, you you can't object. Um, uh, you know, uh, without going to tribunal, which seems a bit um, too much. I know we've discussed it before on this podcast. In December last year, when I was holidaying in Adelaide, I saw a man walking his pet alpaca, and I had a very nice chat with him about his alpaca. So it sounds like you would not be a fan of people, people of tenants keeping alpacas in one bedroom units. Um, no, not in one bedroom units. Probably not in any unit. Um, uh, it, it would have to be at least a, a house with a very large backyard, if not a rural property. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's contact the Tasmanian government and ask them to to put an alpaca clause in the bill. Um, I, I'm wondering also, Owen, from your own experience as a property manager, how open are landlords to accepting tenants with pets? Uh, most are generally okay. Uh, there, there, there can be spe uh, specific property owners who are just want a blanket no pets policy, and um, we always recommend to them to uh, have um, uh, tenants uh, allow tenants to make application uh, with uh, with their pet. Um, and to accept applications with pets and uh, to uh, go through the application um, and consider the pets because sometimes pet owners can be the best owners um, and the best tenants, uh, I should say. Um, and some owners prefer pets over kids. Uh, <laughs> and so it's it comes down to the application. It's uh, if there's good references um, for the pet. I mean, if it's if it's a puppy that's like three months old, then it's just like, oh, what's he going to be chewing on, uh, chewing on, and peeing all over, and so on. It's um, and you know if there's uh, five cats, yeah, that might be a problem uh, for some people. And yeah, so it, but if it's, if it's a reasonable pet for the property, then yeah, there shouldn't be an issue with mm. most people. Let me, uh, let me run something by you. I'm a property investor and whenever I've had tenants ask if they can have pets, I've always happily agreed, partly because I love pets and I think the request is reasonable, but also I know it can be hard for tenants with pets to secure accommodation. So. 
I believe allowing a tenant to keep a pet gives me more leverage as a landlord because it's harder for the tenant to find somewhere else to live. So I'm wondering, Owen, do you think purely from a financial perspective that property investors should be happy to receive applications from tenants with pets? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, every property owner, every investor should be happy to receive applications from tenants with pets. And uh, we just assess each application on its merits. You know, it, it's um, it, it's the, the same when we get applications with their, when there's five or six kids. It's um, that's certainly not the preference of most property owners. Um, and it's so if there's a, an application with multiple dogs and cats, um, you know, plus a fish and a bird, then it's um, yeah that that's probably not yeah the the, the best application um, that the um, property owner would be um, ideally looking for. Uh, but yeah, one one cat, one dog, maybe two at most. Yeah, it's it's that's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Well, the next time you have a tenant apply to a Leafield property and they have six kids and six alpacas, you have to let us know. I will keep an eye out for it. <laughs> well, let's move on to our second story, which is unemployment rises, but job market remains tight. Australia's unemployment rate edged up from 4% in May to 4.1% in June. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the unemployment rate is one of the data points the Reserve Bank is watching very closely as it decides what to do with the cash rate. If unemployment rises in tandem with a weakening economy, that would put downward pressure on inflation, which would strengthen the case for the Reserve Bank to reduce the cash rate. But if the labour market remains tight, and if wages growth remains elevated, that would put upward pressure on inflation, which would make the Reserve Bank wary of cutting rates. I mean, do you think it's possible for the inflation rate, which is currently 4%, to fall back into the RBA's target range of two to three percent, while unemployment remains so low. Yeah, that, that's a hard one, Nick. It's uh, you, you would think one would have to, um, you know, go in the opposite direction of the other. And yes, the government and the Reserve Bank is is is. Uh, trying very much so to um, balance that. But um, yeah, generally to be able to get inflation to drop, you need people to stop spending and, and um, people without jobs don't spend on things that they don't need, and um, uh, which is harsh. And, um, but we, we um, uh, it, it, if we all start saving a little more, and spending a little less, uh, then it'll all help to um, uh, solve the situation without us necessarily having to lose our jobs. You, you made a really good point a moment ago, which is that traditionally the people have assumed there's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. If if unemployment kind of goes up, inflation goes down. If inflation goes up, unemployment goes down. Um, that's generally the trade-off. What's interesting is that Again, there's also been an assumption that when the economy slows, when economic growth slows, unemployment goes up. Interestingly, though, over the past year, the economy has slowed right down, but unemployment has basically remained steady. Do you have any theories for why unemployment has remained so low, even though the economy has been so weak for the past year? Well, parts of the economy have been weak, but parts of the economy have still been going gangbusters, and it's and there's high demand for for um, for staff and employment in uh, many particular uh, industries and and regions. Um, uh, yeah, we 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 need more uh, we need more labour force in our economy uh, to meet the demand of um of jobs out there so it's but in in some areas yes with the rising interest rates it's put a dampener on on the economy which we needed to be able to keep inflation in 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 
in um, on track. So it's and this is where the RBA and the government are, are really uh, on this seesaw of of trying not to make one uh, one side uh, fall to the ground too quickly. So it's interesting to see that yes the economy is well um, unemployment is uh, going quite well um, and staying fairly low uh, even though there are demands on the on the economy to to make it slow down um, so yeah it's almost like a a, a, a two-tiered economy in a way and yes trying to balance that is is a is a difficult thing by the way i really like that seesaw analogy you used i've never heard that before but uh i like the visualization i think it captures the dilemma quite well so i think i'm going to steal that one off you yeah that's fine go for it yeah not a well, problem let, <laughs> let, let's move from unemployment to vacancy rates vacancy rate rises but expected to fall that's our third story the national vacancy rate increased from 1.2% in May to 1.3% in June, according to SQM research. However, SQM Managing Director Louis Christopher said this increase was a seasonal fluctuation rather than the sign of a trend. To quote him, based on history, we have now reached the peak in rental vacancy rates for winter. It is likely that starting in July, vacancy rates will begin to tighten again and keep tightening until November. The magnitude of that tightening is what we will watch closely to see if there is anything more than seasonal variations occurring. So far this year, it seems we have recorded very similar vacancy rates compared to the same period in 2023. Louis Christopher also says, overall, the rental market remains in severe shortage and, barring some exceptions, is not expected to materially soften out of the rental crisis for some years. However, much of the structural rental shortage has now been priced into the rental market. And so I do believe the days of 10 to 20% plus annual rental increases have come to an end. Owen, so Louis Christopher is saying, or he's forecasting that the national vacancy rate is likely to decline over the next few months. Does that sound plausible to you? Um, absolutely. It's uh, as we start getting into spring and, and then summer, there's a lot more demand um, and people moving around. Um, so, yes, definitely during the winter months, um, properties can sit on the market uh, for a little bit longer. So the vacancy rates can just edge up a little bit. And Louis Christopher has been around for a, a very long time. Even longer than me. It's uh, so I... I yeah, well, I've been quoting him, uh, quoting Louis Christopher for um, 25 years, and um, as a, as an expert in the media. So, um, yes, he, he's um, he's bang on. Your property management business, Lee Field, you operate in five states, so, so you have an eye on lots of different markets around the country. Another thing that Louis Christopher has said is that the national vacancy rate is likely to remain extremely low for several years. Based on what you're seeing out there, does that sound right? Uh, across the board, yes. There, there'll be certain areas that um, do fluctuate from time to time and where we might see a lot more supply on the market. So we might see rents come down uh, momentarily while there is. and um, But any supply, any excess supply that comes onto the market does get um, sucked up fairly quickly. Uh, and and that's across all five states that we're operating, and yeah, we we've um, seen it several times this year already. And um, but the the good thing with that extra supply as it comes on, uh, the the um, rate of increase has definitely slowed down a lot. Mm, there was another key thing Louis Christopher said that I want to run by you. So he also made the point that despite the fact that the vacancy rate is apparently going to remain extremely low for several years. He's saying the days of large annual rental increases of 10 to 20% have come to an end. What do you think of that, anal of that analysis? 
Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, and we're, we're seeing it now across uh, all states that um, the the rate of increase is definitely slowed. Um, to be able to get 10% uh, increases per annum now uh, would be um, probably the absolute most. And in some markets, uh, we would expect them to, to flatten off completely. It's uh, we're, we're noticing that uh, even though, in, again, in most states, agents aren't allowed to ask tenants to um, or imply that they need to put um, higher offers in than the asking price. Um, it, tenants, prospective tenants in applications were still allowed to, to offer more if they wanted to. And uh, we're not we're not seeing that as much anymore and that was and, and and to put it out there that was the main driver that was pushing rents up was tenants offering extra to be able to get into a property mm. and and that's what makes a market it's pe people offering over and above what people are asking you know you, you, you can't argue with that that's what's uh that's what was pushing uh rents up Supply and demand. So, yeah, yeah, supply and demand. We uh, first time we've mentioned it today, <laughs> and so we're not seeing that as much anymore. And as a result, uh, that gives us a clear indication that people are um, uh, at their limits, and the the markets are leveling out in terms of affordability. Yes, pe people who can't afford particular areas or particular types of properties have had to move house to be able to um, find a, a cheaper area or a cheaper type of property um, that they can afford. So, um, yes, the, the market's doing the, its job. And uh, unfortunately, yes, there's um, a few people get that get hurt along the way. Um, but that, that that's life, and we 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 need to be able to learn from it. And um, but the, the the market's leveling everything out. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, thank you, Owen. I always love your insights. We've covered a lot of ground today: vacancy rates, unemployment, alpacas. Great show. Yes, yes. One day I'm looking forward to getting an application with an alpaca, and I'll definitely let you know, Nick. I look forward to it. Thanks for the chat. All right. See ya.